Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture series. I'm Rebecca Gottesman. I'm chief of the stroke branch in NINDS, and I'm really excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Frank Lynn from Johns Hopkins, who's made really major contributions to our understanding of the idea of hearing loss as a modifiable risk factor for dementia. First, some business. For those of you watching remotely, we encourage you to participate in the Q&A after today's presentation. You can do so by clicking on the button just below your video cast window that says send live feedback. Click on that, type in your name and question, and we'll relay this to Dr. Lim at the end of the lecture. You can submit a question anytime, and I hope you do so. For those of you here in person in Lipset Amphitheater, you can use the mics on either side. Um, in addition, we're offering CME credits for this presentation. The CME code for today is 50099. Again, that's 50099. So to return to our speaker for today's talk, uh, Dr. Franklin is professor of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, with joint appointments in geriatric medicine and gerontology in the Hopkins School of Medicine, and in epidemiology and, public and mental health in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's also the inaugural director of the Cochlear Center for Hearing and Public Health at the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and is associate faculty at the Welch Center for Prevention, Epidemiology, and Clinical Research. So Dr. Lin's scientific career actually started as a summer student here during high school and then during medical school uh, here at the NIH, um, did his undergraduate degree at Brown University um, and uh, came to Hopkins for his medical degree, followed by surgery, internship, and ENT residency. During his residency, he also completed a PhD in clinical investigation at the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and did a fellowship um, in microsurgery and otology in Switzerland before he came back to Hopkins and joined the faculty and has been there ever since. Um, he rose through the ranks very quickly, achieving the rank of full professor in 2018, which is also when he founded the, uh, the uh, Cochlear Center and became the inaugural director. Um, Dr. Lin has really made major contributions in the investigation on the role of hearing loss as a modifiable risk factor for cognitive decline and dementia, and his work really was foundational in um, in making hearing loss as a major recommendation from the Lancet Commission on Dementia um, as a potential modifiable, as a major, the major modifiable risk factor for dementia. Um, in addition, he's played a major role on the public health side of things, and you'll hear a little bit about this. Um, his congressional testimony was really largely responsible for the enactment of the Over-the-Counter Hearing Aid Act in 2022. Um, Dr. Lin has been prolific in publications. You're going to hear about some recent exciting work, including the ACHIEVE trial, been highly sought out as a speaker, highly funded through NIH institutes, including NIDCD and NIA, um, and uh, really has also been a tremendous mentor um, and, and all the while doing a, a, an active clinical practice while doing all of these things. Um, we're really excited to have Dr. Lin here today. He's going to speak to us about hearing loss and dementia from epidemiological findings to the ACHIEVE trial and public policy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lin. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you all for being here in person. It's, um, it's really a treat for me coming back here, and um, as Rebecca alluded to, I was um, here as a summer student when I was 17 years old, and I used to attend these lectures. And while I like to say I hopefully was inspired by all the wonderful science I heard around me, I'll be honest, I usually fell asleep. Um, much of science was way above my head when I was 17 years old, so if I have one goal today for those who are joining in person online is to hopefully no one falls asleep. That's obviously my kind of goal. Um, all right, I have a few disclosures. None of these companies or products will be discussed today at all. They're not relevant to today's talk. Um, and I'll say um, the talk is titled From Epidemiological Insights to the Achieved Trial Public Policy, but I, I probably should have titled it from really beginning from clinical insights. And what I mean by this is during my training in, in, in ENT surgery at Hopkins from 2003 to 2010, you know, I would see an audiogram like this, and this basically shows uh, this seven-year-old child, let's say Maria, for instance, uh, has a mild progressing to a moderate model of severe hearing loss. And, it doesn't matter who you ask, you could ask a clinician, you could ask an insurance company, uh, you could ask a parent, you could ask a school teacher, and they would say this hearing has to be addressed. This could impact this degree of auditory encoding or impairment auditory encoding can affect this child's brain, can affect how well this child can engage in a classroom and on the playground setting. And because of that, this would definitely be treated. And the amazing paradox of that, though, is if I said suddenly, now Maria is 72 years old, the same hearing test, the same functional impact on auditory encoding in terms of communication for the brain, the signal that's received by the brain. And all of a sudden, for a 72 year old, I'll tell you, the reaction you'll get, even among clinicians, will be a bit of a, eh, okay. You know, you have a mild to moderate hearing loss. I guess you could do something about it if you wanted to. So I, I always recognize what bugged me, actually, when I was going through my residency, this, this paradox. Incredibly important for a 70 year old, but all of a sudden, you're 72, and 
it may not be so important anymore. And I think a lot of that psychology comes from this. If we look at how common a hearing loss is across the lifespan, it nearly doubles every age decade. And it's fundamentally because of the inner ear. The inner ear is post-mitotic for the most part. So there's fundamental aging and degeneration in the inner ear that happens monotonically across our lifespan no matter who you are. So if hearing is really rare in children, it's easy to see that it's very important. But if two-thirds of everyone 16 above has a meaningful hearing impairment, I think there's very much a psychology of, well, everyone has it. How could it be important? But that, that bothered me because it didn't really jive necessarily with what I saw clinically. And more importantly, you can actually backtrack that in some very basic logical questions. Well, uh, let's say hearing loss in older adults. Um, well, are there, in fact, any consequences of it? Is it just some age in the inner ear, maybe some mild effects on communication, or is it more than that? And you can imagine to answer that question, you have to have fundamentally epidemiological studies. From there, then, if there is an impact, what happens if we treat the hearing loss? Does that make a difference for older adults? And to do that, you imagine you have to have randomized controlled trials. And finally, if I'm telling you two-thirds of everyone over 60 in the U.S. has hearing, uh, how do you fundamentally address that at scale? And you realize these same questions when applied to children actually have been answered. We know the impact of untreated hearing loss on children. We know what happens if you treat it early on in terms of vocational and educational opportunities. And then we know how to treat it in children. You have universal newborn hearing screening. These same questions when applied to adults, though, as I began my academic career at Hopkins in 2010, though, I realized much of the bias we had for hearing loss in adults was basically because these basic questions hadn't been answered. So these questions still drive much of what I do today. This will drive the research group I direct at Hopkins with really asking these three basic questions. What I'm going to focus today specifically on is some of the work we've done specifically around hearing loss and dementia that, that Dr. Gosman alluded to, and then take you through um, the trials that have been done around it, and then from there, a very briefly at the end, just a few slides on how that's begun to shape policy in the United States and around the world. Um, so this, the reason why I looked at dementia early on my first joined the faculty in 2010 was because uh, during residency, as I sort of got bothered by the fact that there seemed to be a disparity between what I saw in children and adults, I came across a study, it was published in 1989, a classic from an epidemiologic per per perspective, a sort, of the, sort of the most basic form of epidemiologic evidence, a case control study. 100 cases of patients with dementia, 100 cases of people without dementia, and you looked at who had hearing loss, and you see basically saw on average, basically this dose-dependent relationship between sort of the severity of hearing loss and the odds of having dementia, right? And this was published in 1989. So you can imagine typically, and this, this jived with what I saw clinically. I seen patients, and they would say that, you know, I'm strained to hear more, my, my mother's just not what she used to be, she's just not as engaged anymore. So it jived with what I saw. But since 1989, until I began my faculty position in 2010, there was no further confirmatory evidence. A class of principles of epidemiology, you have a basic case control study that then progressed to a longitudinal epidemiologic study where you confirm it prospectively. But it actually had never been done before. So this, this bugged me. I joined the faculty, and then this is when I came across uh, Luigi Frucci, who some of you may know, he's a scientific director of the, now the NIA. And to this day, I'll forever be grateful to him. So I was introduced to him to a common, through a common friend, common colleague, and I said, Dr. Frucci, back then he was, uh, he, was, he was just the director of the longitudinal study section at the BLSA, he wasn't a scientific director yet. And I said, I, you know, I got introduced to you and I'm interested in looking at the subject and this topic. I know, you, I know you directed the BLSA. Would you, be, would, you be, would you be willing to collaborate with me? He said, absolutely. So he introduced me into his lab. And then uh, coincidentally in the BLSA, in the early 90s, they had measured hearing for about a four-year period until actually, no joke, the audiometer broke and they stopped measuring hearing actually in the study. But they had date, good hearing data for a good four-year period. So we looked at the data, looked at 640 adults who had been followed prospectively from 1990 until basically the present day in 2011, 2012. They had adjudicated measures of dementia over time. And we saw this very, very clear relationship between the severity of hearing loss at baseline, there's a Kaplan-Meier plot on the left looking at time to dementia, between the severity of hearing loss at baseline and the risk of progressing to dementia. And if you apply some statistical modeling to it where we adjust for nonlinear effects of age, sex, race, et cetera, you saw, was, again, clear relationship between on average, compared to a normal hearing, people with a mild, a moderate, and a severe hearing loss, basically on average having a two-fold, three-fold, five-fold greater hazard or, or risk of dementia over time. So this is the first time it was ever prospectively confirmed a study that had been published 22 years earlier that had never been prospectively confirmed yet. Now, more importantly, though, you can imagine, though, at this time period, too, we began thinking, well, why could this be the case? It jived with what I saw clinically, but what, in fact, would be the basis for 
you know, hearing, uh, an audiometric measure of hearing is very much a measure of the auditory periphery. It's, you know, the cochlea, the inner ear transducing and sending sounds to the brain. How, in fact, could that be related to the cognitive output, cognitive client dementia, fundamentally an output of the brain's function? And if you think about it enough, well, of course they're related, but it's through some type of common cause. The fundamental aging process in the inner ear and the brain, perhaps microvascular disease that affects the cochlea and affects the brain, or maybe some other unknown risk factors. But you can imagine this is the only thing that relates to the association. It, it, it's just, it's academically interesting, but that's about it. It implies nothing of what we ever do to potentially address, treat hearing loss, whatever, make a lick of difference on things like cognitive client dementia. It's like saying, you know, white hair is linked with dementia, which, which it is, right? But it's obviously just a common pathology. So the real question as we began thinking about this in early 2010, 2011 was, well, what in fact could the mechanisms be through which peripheral auditory impairments as defined by audiometry, could contribute an increased risk for cognitive client dementia over time. And I'll, I'll apologize, I this summarized 50 years of work from other people that we sort of pulled together to synthesize these models. But there are three major mechanisms now, as commonly understood, for how hearing loss, peripheral auditory impairment, could contribute to the risk of cognitive client dementia. The first one's the idea of cognitive load, and it's the idea that when the brain is constantly receiving a much more garbled auditory signal from the ear, does a brain constantly have to reallocate cortical resources to dealing with the processing and decoding of that signal? And does that load come at the expense of other systems? So namely, as, as probably many of you realize, there's, there's a buffer called broad called cognitive reserve, cognitive resilience that can buffer uh, dementia pathology, say Alzheimer's disease pathology, from presenting phenotypically. And there's various things that may build cognitive reserve over time. So does hearing loss constantly tax that cognitive load, constantly tap, tap into that cognitive load that otherwise could have been used to buffer against pathology contributing to phenotype, but now that buffer is sort of constantly being exhausted by dealing with impaired hearing. And don't forget, impaired hearing or hearing is not a load you can turn on or off. Your brain is constantly processing auditory information, whether you like it or not. In the middle of the night, you're still processing auditory information. It's like a fixed load there as opposed to intermittent load. So that's one mechanism that's all broadly called information degradation hypothesis. Another mechanism, which sounds uh, similar, but actually I'll say it's very, very different, it's the idea that hearing impairment in and of itself can have direct effects on the brain's structural integrity. So basically sort of process of auditory deprivation leading to faster rates of brain atrophy as well as reorganization of patterns of brain neural network activation. We actually see this now both cross-sectionally in human studies as well as longitudinally actually in human studies as well. Find the third mechanism, I'll say a little more nebulous but probably very much common sense in many ways too, that if um, you can't hear as well, you might not be as socially engaged. Even if you are socially engaged, you may be slightly more withdrawn from conversations. Much, much research going on for the last several decades showing how the process of being remaining socially engaged, remaining engaged with people around you is very likely, very important likely for maintaining your cognitive health through very, very uh, different mechanisms. So um, I'll summarize briefly here again, three major mechanisms to which we think that hearing loss hypothetically could be plausibly linked with increased risk of cognitive client dementia. There's evidence to support all of these. The important thing to note, though, is not one's correct, other ones are wrong. It's likely a combination of, of all of the above. Now, um, fast forward now, that first trial, our first study we published was in 2011, initial JAMA was in 1989. Since then, there's been much other, many other papers sort of showing the same results coming from our research group as well as groups from around the world. And I think this is best summarized, as Dr. Gosman briefly alluded to, um, the Lancet Commission on Dementia in 2020, actually 2017 too, they did a major meta-analysis of all the existing extant research that has looked epidemiologically at basically all these different risk factors uh, that are potentially modifiable for dementia and basically um, how much each contributed dementia over time. And when they summarize all the existing literature a few years ago, uh, they conclude about 60% of dementia risk is essentially from um, sources that we don't even know what they are. But about 40% of dementia risk may be potentially modifiable with ex essentially these known risk factors. And when they rank order these risk factors in terms of how many cases they could theoretically contribute to, hearing loss identifies the single largest potentially modifiable risk factor. And the reason why it's so large is because the risk ratios between hearing loss and dementia are actually quite substantial. And on top of that, hearing loss is by no means a rare condition. This is a highly prevalent condition. You multiply the two together, and that's why theoretically they identify hearing loss as being the single largest potentially modifiable risk factor. Now, importantly though, potentially modifiable. Potentially modifiable because theoretically there are these mechanisms that link hearing with dementia. That's the potential part. And I'll say it's further potential because that implies then you can actually do something about it. 
Right now, we can certainly not reverse hearing loss, we can't cure hearing loss, but we can rehabilitatively treat hearing loss, mainly through the use of hearing interventions like hearing aids, as well as related audiological support services to provide a clear auditory signal to the brain. Could this intervention actually modify these pathways to reduce cognitive decline? Right, so, and hypothetically, you think it may be able to. If you're providing a clear auditory signal with, let's say, a well-fit hearing aid, you hope you can reduce cognitive load by providing a clear auditory signal to the brain. At the same time, you certainly hope you're providing increased auditory neural brain stimulation with, you know, use of a hearing aid. And finally, the whole reason we treat hearing loss is obviously to hopefully help people's social engagement. So it brings up the fundamental idea of hearing loss or hearing intervention and potentially reducing the risk of cognitive decline dementia in late life. And that gets very interesting, right? Because there are plenty of 75-year-olds out there, out there with untreated hearing loss now. The idea of an intervention which is essentially risk-free, there's no medical risk with using a hearing intervention, that could potentially lower risks within a few-year period for a, you know, an intervention that has no medical harm, per se, is incredibly appealing. Whereas many other, uh, the most important risk factors, I would say, for dementia, early life education, midlife vascular disease, you can't really address it now when someone's 75 years old presenting to you in clinic today. By the way, the hearing loss being still be modifiable in late life becomes an incredibly appealing public health target. Now, unfortunately, though, this question, though, of whether, well, if we actually fact treat hearing loss, could that, in fact, reduce cognitive decline, this really remained unknown. And the reason you can imagine remained unknown is from observational studies, right? Studies I've shown you before, people use hearing aids versus those who don't. They actually, on average, do better. But you can't attribute that clearly to the hearing intervention because people who got hearing aids were likely to be healthier, wealthier, better educated, right? So was it the underlying factors that allowed them to get hearing intervention or was it actually the hearing intervention? You can't disentangle as much as we like to try. People have tried, and actually one nice um, uh, major meta-analysis of 126,000 people from around the world summarizing all the epidemiological data published actually just nine months ago uh, when they did the major meta-analysis after propensity score analysis controlling for everything they still found that hearing use appeared to be a, 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 associated with a pretty robust decline or risk of decline of long-term cognitive decline. But fundamentally, no prior randomized controlled child had ever looked at this very, very basic question. Namely, if we treat hearing loss, can we in fact reduce cognitive decline over, over a meaningful period of time? So the ACHIEVE trial, which I'm going to spend the bulk of today's lecture talk, telling you about, is, um, was designed to answer this exact question. This was a study funded by the National Institute on Aging for the last nearly 10 years. And it was basically designed to ask a very basic question, namely, if we treat hearing loss among older adults, can we in fact reduce the rate of cognitive decline within just a three-year period? It's called the ACHIEVE trial, sort of a catchy acronym for Aging Cognitive Health Evaluation Studies. The main focus of the, the primary outcome of the trial was looking at global cognitive decline, which I'll define for you in a second. Uh, we have a host of other exploratory outcomes as well. The two I'm going to share with you today are the results of the, co the primary paper, which was published in The Lancet a few months ago. And I'm also really excited to share with you today, uh, really almost for the first time publicly, the initial uh, preliminary unpublished results of the data looking now at effects of hearing intervention on brain structural atrophy as well. So I'll share these two today. All right. Um, I have the first comment. This is, represents the collaborative work of nearly 10 years of work funded by the National Institute on Aging. It involves eight different consortium universities across the United States, funded from 2014 to the present day. It took two years to plan the study from 2014 to 2016 with a clinical trial planning grant, and the trial has been in progress since the end of 2017 until the present day, actually. So when I present this work, I would say really much I'm presenting on behalf of a lot of people. I just happen to be the person in the front right now presenting this all to you. Um, so, study design of what we did with the ACHIEVE study. The final design, I'll tell you, is relatively simple. From basically 2018 to 2019, we recruited nearly 1,000 older adults, 977 older adults between 70 and 84 years old. They had untreated mild to moderate levels of hearing loss, the range of hearing that could be classically addressed with a conventional hearing aid, and they all essentially had no substantial cognitive impairment at baseline. Now, what's interesting is we recruited these 1,000 people from two distinct study populations. About a quarter of the 1,000 people came from an existing study called the Atherosclerosis Risk and Community Studies. This is an observational study of older adults that began in midlife for them and then followed to the present day. This represented a random sample of adults sampled from the communities over 30 years ago. They were literally sampled from uh, voter registration polls, driver's license records, and things like that. So a random sample that were conveniently another study that came into the CHIEF study. I'll tell you why they came into the CHIEF study. 
The remainder of the cohort, we could include everyone from Eric, so the other two, three quarters of people came from uh, what we call de novo or new healthy community volunteers, uh, people who literally responded to uh, Facebook ads, who responded to radio advertisements, newspaper advertisements about a new study focused on healthy aging. Um, they were, everyone was randomized then to either the hearing intervention or a successful aging health education control. I'll define what I mean by that in the last few slides. Then everyone was then followed every six months for the next three years uh, with essentially assessments of a neurocognitive battery as well as other outcomes as well. So uh, the reason why the sample came from Eric as well as from De Novo is that fundamentally the chief study was based within the scientific and the physical infrastructure of this existing observational study called Eric, funded for many years by NHLBI. The Eric study uh, involved nearly 16,000 people that were recruited midlife 30 years ago, 35 years ago now, at four different sites across the United States, and they've all been observationally followed to date just to monitor for cardiovascular events and cardiovascular health. Right? And again, these people were, they came from a random sample when they're sampled from the communities over 35 years ago. Um, and they've been followed since then, obviously, with assessment of cardiovascular health. In 2011, with Dr. 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 Gosman's help, we, this, this study was expanded to include also neurocognitive assessment. And then when I joined in 2013, also included measures of hearing. So we were able to pre-screen, identify people from this existing observational study, and recruit them into this ongoing trial. Now, because of this, the ACHIEVE study came from, again, two cohorts. The AIR cohort, again, representing, at that time, a random sample of the US population. And the de novo cohort, new healthy volunteers, tongue in cheek, literally 83 year olds responding to Facebook ads, right? So you can imagine these two groups with a random sample versus a self selected volunteer group may be a little different, and you'll see how different as we are in the following slides. All participants who joined the study, uh, they were told they'd be randomized to one intervention, and three years later, they would also be, also the, also be offered the other intervention as well. Uh, some of the main inclusion criteria I went over before everyone was between 70 and 84 years old when they entered the study. Uh, they all had a threshold level of a mini mental status exam to make sure there was no substantial cognitive impairment at baseline. They all had a range of hearing loss, basically a pure tone average between 30 and 70. That's the classic range where people could still benefit from basically conventional hearing aids, basically, right? Uh, give you a perspective, that range of hearing, that is basically fully about 50% of people, FIT 50 50% of people in the 70, 84 year age would have this level of hearing impairment. So this is the majority of adults almost, not like a small segment, right? Uh, they had to be community dwelling, and then um, there's some exclusion criteria for people who may not benefit as much or who would be very difficult to get um, neurocognitive assessments on, hence the, uh, the visual exclusion as well. Um, in terms of the design, uh, they're randomized. So there was a, uh, we did stratified randomization. The hearing intervention, very, very briefly, this is basically as close you can get to best practice hearing intervention. There was a study audiologist. Uh, every person who was randomized to hearing intervention had four sessions with a study audiologist over the first few months of study where they had a comprehensive the hearing exam, they had a needs assessment to see what kind of communications need they had, they got fitted for hearing aids that were covered by the study, as well as any other related hearing technologies. If they were in meetings a lot, that was not common. Let's say if they listened to TV a lot, they got a TV streamer so they could hear the TV better, things like that. Then they were seen every six months thereafter for a booster session with an audiologist. The other arm of the study got what we call a health education control. So this is actually, this is actually a real program. It's called the 10 Keys to Successful Aging Program. And it's actually a program designed for how you educate older adults around key healthy aging topics. Topics like nutrition, cancer screening, diet, and things like that. So over the beginning of the study, they had four sessions with a certified uh, health educator where they went over each of these topics. And then every six months thereafter, they also had a booster session with a health educator to receive another topic. So both groups of people were exposure match in terms of their amount and degree of exposure to study personnel. And that's the reason for that is obviously important because even just exposure to study personnel could possibly be good for your, you know, your social and cognitive health. So they're balanced for that. Um, the design of the study, so there's a baseline assessment when they join the study. Every six months thereafter, they were then seen in person uh, for basically in-person assessment and a booster visit. The primary endpoint that was defined is change from baseline to their year three global cognition standardized factor score. I'll define what that means in a second, but basically it comes from the comprehensive neurocognitive battery. Uh, the secondary cognitive domains, which I'll briefly touch on, were basically um, specific cognitive function for memory, executive function, and language. I'll find that in a second. Also, a measure of incident cognitive impairment as adjudicated by a panel of clinicians. And there are a whole host of other pre-specified exploratory outcomes looking at uh, measures of hearing handicap, a measure of communication, uh, 
social networks, UCLA loneliness scale, depression, physical activity, et cetera. I'm only going to share with you today briefly um, the cognitive function data as well as um, the brain MRI data. So the Achieve Neurocognitive Battery, this was uh, designed over a decade ago by David Notman and Marilyn Albert in, in, in concert with the, the ERIC investigators. Um, there are 10 neurocognitive tests that comprise the neurocognitive battery. The thing I want to emphasize, though, is that only two of these, uh, what is it, eight of these 10 cognitive tests do not have exclusively auditory stimuli. Two of these tests have only exclusively auditory stimuli, right? So the reason I mention that is people always assume, well, maybe someone's not doing well on a cognitive, so they can't hear the examiner. That honestly wouldn't be the case. For a mild to moderate level of hearing loss, face-to-face -face in a quiet room at three feet distance, speech comprehension isn't compromised. We can actually measure that, which we did. You can actually verify speech understanding. But even theoretically, if it was, eight of these 10 cognitive tests do not have only exclusive auditory stimuli. But again, even before these cognitive tests, you always verify speech understanding ahead of time to make sure speech understanding would not be compromised, which again, it shouldn't. Face-to-face, -face, three feet away, mild to moderate hearing loss, 50% of older adults in this range, it wouldn't be, but just to, be sure, just to make sure we actually verified ahead of time. These 10 neurocognitive tests spanning sort of different domains of cognition, they can be summarized into one cognitive factor score. We can think of it broadly as just like a Z-score on this but it's a little more sophisticated because you can allow for differential item functioning and the difficulty of certain tasks and different uh, items. But you can summarize from that one global cognition factor score. That is then standardized to baseline. So basically that arbitrary score is set. So if you're at zero, it means you're at the mean. If you're one, it means you're one standard deviation from the mean. If you change over three years from, uh, if you change by negative 0.4 over three years, it means you've changed 0.4 standard deviations over three years. Clinically speaking, half standard deviation change would be considered very, very clinically meaningful, which give a range of uh, results. But everything's standardized to these SD units, right? Um, with that as well, you can also define three different specific cognitive domains that pull in different cognitive tests. Uh, the language domain, this is language production, not language reception. So this is basically uh, name all the letters, uh, name all the words, given the letter F, for instance. Name all the animals you can't miss. It's all language production. Executive function, the sort of multitasking in many ways. Uh, memory is pretty intuitive. All right, so the statistical analysis, I'll go over briefly here. Um, so the main analysis is an attention to treat analysis. Uh, it basically, we're looking, we're modeling the effect of basically assignment to the hearing intervention versus assignment to the control over three years. Uh, these all were mixed effects models, so we account for change over time, and we also adjust for any potentially random variation, some baseline variance in terms of the baseline demographics, which there really was none, but we still adjust for baseline levels of hearing, we adjust for recruitment source, ERIC versus de novo, age, sex, et cetera, present APOE4 alleles as well. Um, there was some missing data, I'll go over that second, there actually, there actually was not very much missing data at all, but we still impute in missing data using uh, multiple impedance by chained equations to impute in any missing data at year three. The main analysis is basically looking at only baseline data and year three data. We do not use the intervening years unless we have to if someone died before year three, for instance, right? Uh, Pre-specified sensitivity analysis is a very important one to note. Is pre-specified. We said that we would obviously the main analysis is the whole cohort, but we also mentioned a priori that we would replicate the primary analysis stratified within ERIC and within de novo because we recognize these two populations may be very, very different. One, a random sample of the U.S. population, essentially. The other one represents self-represented 70, 80 year olds responding to Facebook ads. It could be a very different effect. Um, there's one thing I'm always really proud of is uh, for any of you who have done clinical trials, you know that recruitment always kills clinical trials. Um, this is a recruitment curve. So the blue line would have been if we had evenly recruited 850 people over a year and a half period. We were two and a half weeks behind schedule with hitting 850. Uh, given that recruitment was going very, very well, actually, we actually approached the NIA about keeping recruitment going a little longer just to get to a slightly higher end to have a more definitive result, whether positive or negative, and they allowed us to do it. So we ultimately hit a sample size of 977 and closed off recruitment at the end of October 2019. Um, over, this is the consort figure. Over three years, one thing I'm thrilled to say, you can see how people are lost over time, but the main takeaway is this. Three years later, through a pandemic, we had complete follow-up data on 90% of people. This was amazing, and this was, I think, just honestly a testament to the study staff of the four Eric and Achieve field sites, the incredible professionals that are bringing back people through a pandemic, in-person visits, three years later, 90%, right? So we lost 10% from loss of follow-up, people who died, unfortunately. We had been, quote, unquote, budgeting for all, up, up to 70% loss of follow-up, I mean, 30% loss of follow-up, 70% completion in three years, and we exceeded by a wide margin. Again, I think it's a testament 
probably to study intervention as well as more importantly to the study staff. So I think what you're going to see here is from an internal validity point of view, very, very high quality data. Now I'm going to show you some baseline characteristics by recruitment source. If you, if you look at basic characters by intervention and control, they're basically balanced as you expect them to. But just to highlight how different the de novo cohort is compared to the ERIC, which ERIC is a random sample, de novo again, self-selected volunteers. You see on average, de novo cohort, they had on average fewer risk factors for cognitive decline by virtue of being slightly younger. If you look at their education, they're slightly better educated, less, less people who have only less than high school education. Definitely much, much higher levels of income on average as well among the de novo versus the ERIC. If we look at rates of things like diabetes, hypertension, living alone, also higher, I'm sorry, lower in the de novo than the ERIC. Again, the self-selected population may be very different from a random cohort. Also interesting, if you look at their baseline cognition scores, that baseline, right, you see uh, among the global executive function language and memory, these again are all standardized units. You see that the de novo cohort on average starts above the mean uh, versus ERIC starts slightly below the mean in this group sample, right? So they're starting at a very, very different point. Again, by virtue, likely these are two very different recruitment sources. All right, so before proceeding to the results, you can imagine a natural question to be even begin with, before even jumping to the cognitive results is, well, is there any evidence that hearing intervention is actually even working? Namely, is there any evidence of target engagement? Are people even using the hearing aids? Is it, are the hearing aids even really benefiting people, like communication-wise, to suggest there could be distal effects on cognition? So this is one thing I'm, I'm very proud to show, too. This is, you have to turn your head sideways. There are histograms of the hours of hearing aid use among the people randomized to hearing intervention. And you see at six months, one, two, and three years, consistently robust and relatively high rates of hearing. It's spinning at 10 hours, six months, trailing off three years later through a pandemic, so on, on, on a median use of about seven hours. There's obviously some variability. Some people are using it less than an hour per day. Some people use it 20 hours a day. But the median rate of use three years later still being about seven hours per day for a population of now 73 to 87-year-olds, right? The next thing is then, well, does that hearing use actually trickle out and does actually meaningfully impact communication? So this is something called the hearing handicap inventory. It's a self-reported measure of communication function. Higher scores indicate more communication impairment. There are questions like, do you feel embarrassed when you go out with friends and family? Uh, do you struggle in conversations? Typically, say scores above 10 are considered significant. What you can see in the left, the, among the control group, they start around a score of 14. And in the month of control group, three years later, their communication impairments would only get worse over time. Again, it makes sense. Their hearing, their hearing impairments not being addressed at all. In contrast with the hearing intervention group, you see that score drop and stay down over a three-year period. So evidence, again, of target engagement not only in terms of hours of hearing use, but this trickling out it appears to in terms of communication function as well. So you can imagine a question then, well, does that mean then, does that trickle out three years later to reduced cognitive decline? Are you actually slowing down any global cognitive decline you would see naturally over a three-year period? So I'll, I'll give you the summary figure first and then some, a couple of sensitivity analysis, which are the key ones. If you look broadly at the total cohort, right, and I'll take you through this figure. If you look on the left, this is a global measure of cognition. You see the control group over three years, on average, they decline about negative 0.202 standard deviation units. They decline by 0.2 standard deviation for three years. If you look at the hearing intervention, three years later, it's basically the same. So no apparent effect at all of hearing intervention on reducing cognitive change over a three-year period of the total cohort. If you look within the cognitive domains, eh, maybe a signal of memory, but clearly nothing that meets any pre-specified criteria. So a first pass, slightly discouraging. The hearing intervention does appear to be doing anything within three years for cognition, at least. I always mention, though, we always pre-specify in advance that we recognize that a random sample of the population, namely Eric, versus a self-selected de novo population responding to Facebook ads 83 may be very different. So we, we, we always pre-specify that we will always replicate the primary analysis stratified by cohort. And this is where you see a very, very different result. So you see among ERIC that the control group declines much faster. They decline about 0.402 standard deviation units. The hearing intervention group declines about 0.211, so that represents about a 48% reduction in three-year rate of cognitive change among the error cohort. You see that sort of trickling out to each of the cognitive domains, actually strongest in the language domain. In contrast, if you look at the de novo cohort, you see no effect. You see, so what, what gives here, and it becomes clear if you look a little closer, more closely at, at the figure, if you look at the rate of cognitive change over three years in the de novo control subjects, 
versus the Eric control set. Remember, so a self-selected, really healthy volunteers, 83 year olds responding to Facebook ads versus a random sample. You see on average, the de novo cohort has a three-fold slower rate of cognitive change over a three-year period compared to Eric. So why is this, right? So I mentioned before, they're self-selected. They have many fewer risk factors for cognitive decline at baseline. And that's trickling out three years later, you're seeing a two to three-fold, two and 2.6-fold, 2.7-fold, slower rate of cognitive change in the de novo cohort versus the error court representing, at one point, a random sample of the U.S. population. So one way of interpreting this is that if you have, among the de novos, a very, very slow rate of cognitive change over three years, a hearing intervention, which is predicated on slowing cognitive change, can't slow down something that's already going down very, very slowly, right, at least within three years. In contrast, the error cohort, having a steeper rate of cognitive decline over three years among the controls, there's actually room to see reduction in that slope within a three-year period. So a brief summary of the, the main cognitive results so far. In the total combined cohort, we're not seeing an effect of hearing intervention on reducing cognitive decline. When we do a pre-specified stratified analysis, as indicated in, in, our, in our analysis plan, we see very strong effects in ERIC. The random sample of the U.S. population nearly seeing a 48% reduction in cognitive decline, again, we would say in population that risk for cognitive decline, actually show cognitive decline. In contrast, you see no effect observed in de novo, but again, I think the key thing here is when you have a very slow background rate of cognitive change over a three-year period, you can't really detect any further slowing of that cognitive change within a three-year period. If you compare these rates of cognitive change to the existing literature, what you see is among the de novo controls, which is on average 0.05, one twentieth of a standard deviation unit per year, versus the error control, about 0.13. This corresponds roughly what's been described in the literature as a slow versus a moderate rate of cognitive decline. So among a random sample of the U.S. population, 70, 84, you're seeing a more of a moderate rate of cognitive decline. Among a self-selected group of very healthy volunteers, you're seeing a slow rate of cognitive decline. Why the slow rate of cognitive decline among the de novo controls? One clear potential reason for it is, again, these are very healthy volunteers. They represent fundamentally a different study population than a random sample of the U.S. population that Eric represented when they were recruited 30 years ago. Um, so I'll move on now briefly now to um, some other, I think, for, for us, I think really exciting findings to see is uh, the exploratory effects of hearing intervention on, on brain structure. Right? And I'll mention here, this is literally um, hot off the computer, per se. These results have resulted just in the last week. These are unpublished uh, right now, but these are pretty close to the final analyses that we'll be preparing for, for uh, publication soon. And the background for this, uh, I alluded to it briefly, uh, but I'll give a brief background. Uh, peripheral auditory inputs from the cochlea, I'll say, first are integrated across multiple brain. It's not just a temporal lobe. It's not just the primary auditory cortex. Those sensory afferents are integrated across multiple brain regions as well as neural networks. So not only the default mode network, but also the salience network with other wells and networks. Well. And it goes to the fact that, don't forget, our brain is just encased in our skull. If not for fu five fundamental sens sensory afferents, your brain's not doing much, right? And hearing, probably not surprising, is one of the dominant sensory afferents, along with our vision that supplies our brain, brain with our contextual information around the environment. What we see existing from previous observational data is you see that hearing loss, or basically impoverished auditory coding, it's associated with functional changes in both patterns of resting state as well as task activated patterns of new activity based on you can do high density EEG or fMRI your choice you see these functional changes in people who are age match who have hearing loss and who don't have hearing loss you also see very interesting cross modal plasticity you see on average that older adults age match with those who have hearing loss and those who don't is you see cross modal takeover of auditory areas of the brain by visual tasks right so you're seeing that even in not only in kids, but you see in the older adults, the idea of cross-modal plasticity. At the same time, we also see, based on observational data, increased structural atrophy associated with hearing loss in not only the whole brain, temporal, bo tem temporal lobe regions, parts of the cingulate cortex, as well as the frontal gyrus and the default mode network regions, right? And these are both usually cross-sectionally, but a few longitudinal studies we've done, actually with the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging and Well, the NIA, seeing longitudinal change of hearing loss being associated with faster rates of brain atrophy over multiple brain regions. Now, interestingly, there's not really been much at all looking at how would, quote, unquote, hearing aid use, increase auditory signals going to the brain, how would that affect the brain? Uh, one study has been done, which is relatively small, but very interesting, that they, um, they gave a group of older adults, at baseline, they measured the degree of cross-modal plasticity, how much of visual tasks activated auditory areas of the brain. 
You then fit them for hearing aids. Six months later, you bring them back in, and what you see is you see reversal or reorganization, essentially, of the auditory cortex with that cross-modal plasty. So it's hinting somewhat that a hearing aid can do something functionally in terms of task activation of the brain. The question is, does that trigger something or change something three years down the road? Does consistent or use of a hearing aid, does that lead to longer-term effects on brain function and structure? And that's really completely unknown at this point. And that really gets to the sort of this, the second mechanism I mentioned, the idea that hearing loss may in fact change brain function and structure. The question then, of course, then is, well, does that mean, does a hearing intervention, right, with a hearing aid, does that reduce any of these functional or structural changes within just three years, right? So this is an exploratory outcome uh, that was always planned for the ACHIEVE trial. Um, how this was done, so I mentioned again, the full sample was 977 older adults randomized. Uh, we had an MRI subset. We had a half sample at baseline, 445 people who had a, a three Tesla MRI scan at baseline. Three years later, we only recaptured 303 of them with MRI scans. A reason for losing some people, some people um, essentially were too unhealthy to go through MRI scan three years later. Other people didn't want MRI scan three, three years later. Because of the pandemic and a delay of the three-year start follow-up, some people had fallen out of the window with when they could get a three-year MRI scan relative to their neurocognitive results. So that's why there's only 303 people with follow-up MRI scans three years later. These are all three Tesla uh, scanners. This is uh, operationalized by actually Rebecca Gottesman, as well as uh, Cliff Jack's group, his, who has always done all the, um, uh, the uh, MRI uh, measures for the ERIC study and now the ACHIEVE study. Uh, the regions of interest are all defined using Free Surfer Atlas, again defined by, uh, by Cliff Jack's group at, at Mayo Clinic. And then uh, cortical thickness is measured for each region, again, by, by Cliff Jack's um, group. Um, the CISCO analysis, go over very briefly. The primary analysis we've applied so far is the primary analysis, a two-level mixed effects analysis. Finally, what that means is we treat each lobe of the brain as a different analytic model. So we say hearing intervention versus control effects on frontal lobe. Next model, hearing intervention versus control effects on temporal lobe, et cetera, et cetera. That was a primary model. A different way of looking at this is also assuming some commonalities. So in sensitivity analysis, you can imagine the temporal lobe is not completely distinct from the frontal lobe. There may be some commonality in terms of how an intervention could affect both. So in a sensitivity analysis, what you can do in a three-level model is you include a common effect, and then you also include on top of that a lobe-specific effect. So theoretically, it allows for a little more precision in terms of how you um, estimate the effects of hearing intervention versus control, right? We present both here because um, both are done, but we present both just for sake of consistency. Um, we do multiply impute, again, uh, any missing MRI data at year three, but there was some missing MRI data. The model, similar to the COG results, adjusting for any major baseline covariates that could affect the results. We adjust for recruitment source, age, sex, et cetera, et cetera. Um, ex I, I would mention we consider these exploratory analyses. This was not power to look for any specific effects. So the p-values are provided here purely for, I would say, descriptive purposes, not meant to look for definitive treatment effects of hearing intervention on the brain. It's not what it was designed to do, but they're, they're for descriptive purposes only. So the figure here is, is designed similarly to the, uh, to the cognition results. Uh, what you see, again, I'll go to the frontal lobe. In the frontal lobe, on average, among people uh, who got the control intervention, you see on average about uh, 0.01 millimeter thinning over time. If you compare that to the intervention group, the intervention group appears to be slightly less, so less thinning. You see the general trends across lobes. You see nothing, quote, unquote, meet significance, but these are descriptive only. But you see a clear general direction of trend of the hearing intervention leading to reduced cortical thinning over time that are most pronounced actually not for the temporal necessarily, but actually for the other brain regions. If you apply again to a, um, the sensitivity analysis where you offer a little more precision by drawing uh, inferences across the whole group as opposed to treating each lobe separately, you actually see a similar pattern, actually slightly stronger results, slightly tighter confidence intervals of hearing intervention being associated with reduced cortical thinning, particularly over the occipital and the parietal lobe and actually least over the temporal lobe in fact. Um, lastly, this is, takes then, um, this is a brain mapping done by uh, uh, Andrea Schneider at the University of Pennsylvania, where you can look at within the sub-lobar regions, and we just map it to a brain template to make the, the, the figure easier to interpret. Uh, what this shows, again, the redder it is, the redder implies, or redder is indicating greater degree of reduced cortical thinning with hearing intervention versus control, whereas blue, the bluer it is, theoretically indicates greater cortical thinning with hearing intervention versus control. 
what you see this trend here is like particularly the what's really lighting up per se in the strong effects is um, that's the in the frontal lobe inferior frontal gyrus that's the pars orbitalis which is actually implicated very much in language and speech processing so you're seeing a signal there so in the greater effect you're seeing also is particularly in the cingulate cortex the anterior cingulate cortex very critical for um, uh, sort of relaying of attentional information with auditory information as well. Some areas of very light blue, just not much you're seeing in the temporal lobe, but seeing primarily actually, again, in the pars orbitalis as well as the anterior cingulate. So a brief summary of, I would say, these very exploratory MRI results to date is that uh, we, gen we generally, I would say, see a trend toward hearing intervention possibly being associated with reduced cortical thinning just over three years. I'll be perfectly honest, when we did these analyses, when we suggested an MRI scan, we didn't think we see anything. I mean, three years is not much time, and there seems to be a signal that the hearing aid hearing image is doing something to the brain. If you want to take the general notion that thinning is bad for the brain, it's doing something good. Again, this remains to be further explored. The pattern findings to date suggest that hearing intervention may have greatest effects beyond the temporal lobe. Um, potential mechanism, just a bit hand-waving here, but suggest by some evidence there may be direct effects of hearing and use. The key thing here is on sustained alterations and patterns of neuroactivity and or potentially indirect effects if you're really promoting and increasing social and physical activity, for instance. Theoretically, that could be good for the brain's structure as well, theoretically. Right? Ongoing analysis, we're, doing the, the, we're about to do the voxel-based morphometry analyses now, and then um, we'll present this initially as another paper. All right, so um, the last five minutes, sort of a summary of some uh, the results to date, per se, and some policy considerations. I just want to add that into the very end. How I spend most of my time nowadays actually isn't doing science, it's actually doing more policy, actually. But they sort of go hand in hand. I'll show you where that's going. Um, so achieve study key findings. I, I, can, I think you can say after three years, there appears to be very high adherence and satisfaction with a hearing intervention. Satisfaction, I didn't show you, there's actually a question we asked about satisfaction, which I didn't show you today, that's sustained over three years with clear positive effects on self-perceived communication impairment. Uh, we do see strong effects of potentially hearing intervention reducing cognitive change, 48% reduction for basically the error cohort that basically was a group that came from a random sample of the population. The exploratory MRI analysis suggests, suggests, I'll say additional possible biomarker effects within just three years on reduced cortical thinning. Key inference here reflected in the Lancet paper is that hearing intervention may reduce cognitive decline or cognitive loss within three years for those populations actually at risk for cognitive decline within three years. So implication for policy in the last few slides, I would say as we interpret scientific evidence to clinical recommendations of policy, it always, always requires extrapolation. No scientific study ever replicates the exact study you want to extrapolate to. So extrapolation of scientific data to clinical recommendations of policy always depends on extrapolation and balancing of risk versus benefit, right? So I would say even before this trial came out, this is already beginning to happen. So we look at the current, the previous recommendations from the 2020 Lancet Commission on Dementia, as well as the 2021 U.S. National Plan for Alzheimer's Disease. These reports already both call for addressing hearing loss in the context of national dementia prevention strategies. And I think this is fair, even for the trials out is all risk versus benefit. The risk of hearing intervention is, I'll say theoretically, primarily financial risk. There's no medical risk. The benefits are clearly communication, things like that, and possibly reduced cognitive change with three years for those at increased risk. So I think the extrapolation is justifiable in that sense. Now with the trial results, I would say, showing, uh, I would say, relatively strong effects for those at risk, um, as well as even potential biomarker effects on the brain, it does call into action uh, or perspective other policy actions. Uh, one bitter paradox that I have to face, that many of you who are clinicians have to face, is that this hearing intervention offered in achieve just hearing intervention with hearing aids and audiologists, right now this best practice of hearing intervention would not be covered under traditional Medicare. So hearing aids and any related service under traditional Medicare are statutory exclusions written into the 1965 Social Security Act. To change that, you have to change functionally the legislative law. It's not an administrative decision, it has to be changed in the law, right? So clearly, I think if we believe that hearing intervention can make a difference in someone's life communication-wise, perhaps even communicate, perhaps even for reducing cognitive loss, you have to have some insurance coverage. That's, that's something we have to work on. We fundamentally have the regulations. Hearing aids are ridiculously expensive for many reasons. One way is how they're regulated. So regulations that promote the development of an OTC hearing aid market. Companies like Samsung, Apple, there's no reason why they could not make OTC hearing aids. In the past, which is fortunately has changed, I'll tell you though, um, that wouldn't happen. So you could never get that scale, economies of scale to drive innovation. And finally, the bitter paradox is even though we think hearing is important, I'm guessing for most people in this room, you might have gotten your hearing measured uh, when you're six or seven in primary school, and for the average American, you'll never have your hearing tested ever again 
until you're 80 years old and your spouse is screaming at you to get your hearing <laughs> tested, right? right? So all the talk about hearing, whereas no one knows what their hearing is, that's a fundamental barrier. Now, I'm really excited to end on this, though, because these are areas that we've already made a lot of progress on and they're continuing very, very quickly, especially now the trial results came out. Uh, this is the first one, which is the most disappointing in a way, but I'll say uh, two years ago, the White House Build Back Better Act, we actually got written to that Medicare hearing coverage. So probably remember that was a $1.75 trillion spending bill that was for child care and preschool, home care, et cetera, et cetera. And lo and behold, there was a $35 billion carve out for 10 years of Medicare hearing care coverage. That would have covered hearing care services and devices. Unfortunately, it did not pass out of the Senate, but at least we got close and more point, the legislative language there is to be resurrected. Some people have asked, how did this happen? Some of the policymakers I worked with in Congress and, and, and the Senate, and part of the, the way they put it is that we captured the imagination of policymakers very early on about how important this could be to public health, right? So I think that's one reason why you see this one little $35 billion carve out for Medicare hearing among everything else there, it's still gone in. Obviously the whole build in advance, unfortunately, but now that the legislative language is there, it makes it much easier to resurrect in later cycles. So this is probably the least successful thing, but at least it's clear progress. Um, something I'm equally excited to talk about that was alluded to before is um, federal passage of the Overcounter Hearing Act 2017. This represented many years of work, actually, with the National Academies. Subsequent after that, with the National Academies, actually, with with, uh, with uh, NIDC Director Deb Tucci, then leading then to the White House Presence Council of Advisors Technology, also taking on this issue, that led to recommendations that the U.S. government should re-regulate hearing aids to allow for greater competition, to allow for companies like Samsung, Apple, Bose to enter the market to innovate in the space. Um, that was a bill that received bipartisan support in the Senate side by Chuck Grassley, Elizabeth Warren, to this date, one of their signature bipartisan accomplishments. On the House side back then, it was, it was Joe Kennedy and Marsha Blackburn. I mean, you can't get two more die opposing sides of the aisle, but it came together because from the Democratic side, you can position this as increasing access and affordability. From the Republican side, you can, still, you can position this as this is breaking down monopolistic barriers that will offer increased competition. So this bill got advanced quite, pretty quickly. It advanced, it was, it was, it was, a issue, it was um, uh, introduced in March 2017. It got signed to law five months later. I had to testify on behalf of it because there was actually a lot of opposition still to it from sort of the entrenched hearing aid industry, unfortunately. Uh, but it did advance. These final regulations went into effect just over a year ago. So you will begin seeing over the next two, it'll take a few years to settle out. You'll see the whole U.S. hearing market in the next two or three years dramatically change as these much, much bigger companies that we've all heard of begin to enter the space and innovate the space. It won't take two or three years to enter the space, though, because people are still figuring out how the marketing works, how you introduce it, how do you price it. That's all still being figured out in real time. But this is federal law. This makes the, the U.S. the first country in the entire world to have a regulated market for OTC hearing. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the world, actually. All right. Third thing I'll say that I'm, I'm really, really this is what I spend, actually spend a lot of my time on actually nowadays is this fundamental paradox that no one here knows what your hearing is. I'm guessing no one knows what your hearing is, right? And that's that's the fundamental issue. We think hearing now being important, and if no one knows their hearing, lots of people got their hearing test when you're seven years old. That's a problem. Uh, so beginning over, and I'll say one thing very important there is when consumers know something about their health through a metric, think about your blood glucose, your blood pressure, it changes behaviors. It changes how you think about what to do about it. For the past year, I've been working with the Consumer Technology Association and then with ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, to develop the standard. It's called the CTA ANSI standard for the four frequency pure tone average testing average. What this basically means is that going forward, and all in this committee, I'll say with FDA, Amazon, Apple, a company called Mimi, we have now set the standard that as this gets taken up by consumer electronic manufacturers around the world over the next one or two years, every single consumer electronic device, whether it's a wireless earphone, a smartphone, will prompt you to measure hearing give you your hearing, and then customize your audio output on your headphones to meet what your hearing needs are. So I think that's fundamentally a game changer. Everyone understands and knows what they're hearing. It's not whether they have hearing loss or not. The word hearing loss is terrible. Um, it's just what your hearing is. It begins shaping behaviors. My fundamental goal that I spent a lot of my time thinking about now beyond science is my goal is for every teenager and adult around the world to understand and measure and track their hearing number over their lifetime. I think that changes behaviors at an unprecedented scale as we can think about from that sense as well. So I will finish up, this is my last slide here. Oh, and I, for example, okay, this is my hearing number, mine's a 12, and my daughter, 17, hers is a negative three, right? So it sh she makes fun of me now, right? Even though my hearing would be considered normal, it's actually not anymore. I've shifted 15 dBs in, in 15 years. So this is what's happening. This array is on Apple platform. You can actually do it yourself if you want. You can actually download the Mimi app, and it spits out to your hearing number. You can actually understand what your hearing is and the contextualization around it. 
So I'll, I'll begin here. I think this all began with clinical insights many, many years ago. And then what I hope to show you over the last um, maybe 45 minutes at the beginning, how we can translate clinical insights to epidemiologic insights, epidemiologic insights to trials, and then from trials even the policy. And sometimes you don't, need the, you don't need the trials for the policy, and they sort of go hand in hand iteratively as they progress along. Um, brief acknowledgments, a huge team of people, 60 different staff and investigators that have been funded by uh, the Achieve trial to date. This is uh, just a, not even a complete sampling of everyone here that's made this, all this, the science possible. Um, this funding support has all come actually from the NIH. Uh, very kudos, thanks to NIDC for supporting me very early with, with a career development which, which sort of launched all this and then since then the NIA uh, with the bulk of funding for the Achieve trial. Uh, all the hearing aids were donated by one of the hearing aid companies. Um, NIH funded this trial, but the hearing aids are actually donated by one of the major hearing aid companies. We're grateful to that as well. Um, and then I will finish up there. This is a cover actually of the Lancet article from a few months ago. Um, and thank you over time. There's more information about the chief study on those websites and the hearing number. If, for those who want to learn what your hearing is, you can go to this website and learn actually how to get your hearing number. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we do have. Lots of questions online. Probably can't get to them all, but Dr. Dr. Tucci, please. You can start. Yeah, thank Frank. Um, <clears throat> thank you and congratulations. It's really difficult to overstate the importance of this study. I mean, the ramifications are tremendous and will continue to be. Um, I am fascinated by the MRI data. I, I too, am shocked by that. You know, you think of auditory deprivation in adults and. Uh, None of us would have ever predicted that the adult brain is plastic enough to really respond um, in this way that you've measured. And, um, you know, when you think about the average length of time between when an adult could benefit from amplification and when they actually get it, I think it's an average of nine years, so it's, mm -hmm. it's a huge amount of time. And I'm wondering um, if you can comment at all um, or if you've looked in your data to see how long the period of hearing loss was in some of the participants before mm -hmm. they entered into your study, and if you think that there's a difference um, given the length of, of time of hearing loss prior to intervention. Thanks. Great question, Deb. And, and I think the, um, the tricky thing there is always is that uh, we think about hearing, as being a, hearing loss being a binary, you know, when did the hearing loss begin and things like that, when realistically, as all of us know, it's, it's, a, it's a monotonic trajectory of our entire lifetime. So in the ACHIEVE trial, at least, um, we obviously had a robust interview survey, of hearing loss, something like that. So the one thing we did want to, oops, we definitely want to exclude is people with any type of congenital or early adult onset, those were those sort of excluded. But from there, though, we obviously didn't have measures on hearing on people years and years ago, so we don't know at what point the accelerated trajectory of how quickly to decline. The one thing we do know is that this was not early onset, this was not early adult onset, this is, we think well, the bread and butter, I should say bread and butter, but the bread and butter here that everyone's experienced over time, um, that was the main thing, but we, uh, there are a few, a sample of the ERIC participants where well, there will be some trajectories, which we can look at actually. Uh, because people from ERIC, they had the hearing previously characterized as well, so we can actually look at that trajectory to some degree. Um, but the key thing there is, for, as far as we know, it's no one is certainly of an early onset or anything like that, These are, and this is all relatively people who are not using hearing aids at the time. Yeah, good question, thanks. Let me uh, get at least one question in over here um, from online. This is interesting, it comes from a colleague at AARP, very good audience for us. So um, can you list the increased risk factors that made the hearing aids most helpful and what percentage of older population fits into this increased risk profile? Mm. So I think the questions there are specifically around uh, the ERIC versus the, the NOVA cohorts. So again, the, um, the ERIC cohort was um, randomly sampled from the population 35 years when they were initially recruited and then the de NOVA was self-selected. So on average, we saw the ERIC cohort or the, me, let's, let's say the Danova had fewer risk factor for cognitive decline on average than Eric, but it, it was just an on average sort of thing. It wasn't like a precise constellation of risk factors. Actually, one of the interesting analysis I'll just mention, I'm not presenting here, which we're just finishing up now, is in the whole cohort, we can do something called a propensity score analysis, and sort of a weighting of multiple risk factors and risk of cognitive decline. And actually, when you analyze the entire cohort that way, what you see, again, is very consistent with these results, is that people have a higher propensity for cognitive decline actually have a protective effect of hearing intervention. Again, not surprising. You have to have cognitive decline for the hearing intervention to reduce an effect, but you do see that type of potential score analysis. But there's actually not a certain constellation or a direct uh, measure. It's more that just theoretically one represents a random sample, at least one point, and that represents a self-selected population. Thanks. Please. Yes. I am. Um, uh, 
elderly male, hearing aid wearer with chronic cardiovascular disease. I take statins and I take uh, clock, clock breakers. <laughs> and I was concerned about uh, your Eric population, which was an unselected group of people midlife who we have reason to believe have chronic cardiovascular conditions. So my question is, did you treat them for those conditions? Did you diagnose and treat them and follow them up for those conditions? Well, great question. So the, um, the air example, they're, you're right, they were recruited over 35 years ago in midlife. At that point, they represent, a, again, a random sample of the population recruited from voter registration rolls, for instance. So they weren't at any increased risk for cardiovascular events. This was a general sample of the population. Um, the ERIC study is an observation that they were not receiving treatment within the ERIC study, but any data regarding their cardiovascular health was relayed to them and their physicians. So over time, we expect many of them obviously had their cardiovascular health treated as they would um, per usual clinical care. If anything, by being in ERIC, they also got additional diagnostics and additional knowledge about their cardiovascular health. But your study did not follow them up. It left it to them to seek out their care. Yes, it's correct. So in, in, they've, they've been followed for many, many years. They've always been followed by their routine physicians as well. So many of them, if they had any type of, let's say, hypertension or diabetes, they were being treated more often than not by their primary care physician. The how many, Eric, of, how yeah. many of them had routine physicians since they lived in communities which uh, had air pollution and other criteria which made them think that makes me wonder how many physicians they had per population and how many physician visits they had. It raises in my mind a question of ethics which has affected negatively this mm. institution in the past. Okay. I mean, and, and so that's why I'm raising the question. You know, th I really appreciate your raising point because it comes down to sort of um, how we treat study populations and how much information we provide them. Uh, the air corps been long over 35 years, long followed, uh, many, many publications, much engagement with study staff. That's why the study have been, have been followed for so long. So I'm happy to talk more offline about it, um, but it's um, a very well studied population that has received, I would say, phenomenal health data from the study for which the study staff are constantly in touch with the participants, physicians in many cases, to relay the health data. I'm happy to chat more about it afterwards if you like that. I can give you a lot more resources for learning more. Yep. I'll just tag on to that. Uh, is there uh, any evidence that vascular risk factors are a modifiable uh, thing for hearing loss? Uh, oh, no. for hearing loss. I think that's for cognitive decline dementia. Um, <laughs> no, that, yeah, no. that I Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's well. Yeah. Um, so, um, yes and no. And what I mean by that, plenty of observational data suggesting cardiovascular risk factors for um, heart health are the same as for hearing health in many ways, likely through the same microvascular mechanisms. Um, I would say, an actually, I'd say anecdotal, but um, from observational data, I would say there's probably, I've never looked at it closely, but in terms of people who are, who have better controlled cardiovascular, they have better hearing, I would say there probably is probably some evidence I haven't looked at it in a while, and it would make sense. Um, there's so not a trial looking at that. That would, trial would have to go on for many, many decades, and there'd be far more, probably more important outcomes to look at besides that for cardiovascular health. Um, but I would say for observational data, I, I, I think if I recall, there has been some studies suggesting better, better control, let's say, uh, midlife cardiovascular and hearing is likely, there are not many studies that could do that, but there probably has some indication of it, yeah, which would make sense with the literature, yeah. Hi, Frank. Congratulations on your beautiful study and wonderful talk. I was wondering, um, for those patients who have mild hearing loss and who have tried hearing aids but don't really like them, what do you tell them? So for the, for the Achieve trial, and Dr. Chen's one of my, my, my neurotology colleagues at Hopkins, looks like you've hopped across the street in your scrubs, actually. Thanks for coming over. <laughs> um, um, so in the Achieve trial, this is, this is an intention to treat. So fundamentally, 
uh, you saw the histogram of hearing aid use. Some people stopped using their hearing aids. So they're still including the cohort purely intention to treat. Likewise, actually, I, I didn't show this, but uh, 17, one seven, 17 percent of the control group, they end up getting hearing aids on their own before they end the study. But this is all intention to treat. So they are treated in their assigned groups, even if you don't use a hearing aid or you got a hearing aid, you shouldn't say you weren't supposed to, but you got an outside study. So everything's intention to treat, so I would say the, re the results in that sense are, are still conservative. If we actually apply, um, you know, do a thing called a per protocol analysis or a compliance average causal effect analysis, uh, where you exclude those people or you treat them differently in terms of analysis, the results actually get stronger. Um, but there's really much being intention to treat study. So some people, they want to use their hearing aids, mm, couldn't do anything about it. More often than not, that very few people actually, I would say, quote unquote, return their hearing aids outright. A few did. Um, some people just stopped using them as much. But um, I, I would say that the testament there is really important, especially if you think about scaling to a population health perspective. The technology is important. What was more important in the study actually was the audiologist remaining engaged with that participant every six months over three years, constantly checking in, assisting them. Because you can imagine for 82 year old not familiar with technology, all of a sudden saying, here, here are your hearing aids, good luck. I guarantee this trial would fail, right? But someone's checking every six months, supporting their use, and that's, that's what really made all the difference likely. But without a doubt, some people, you saw the histogram, some people actually did stop using their hearing aids, but it's still intention to treat, so we had to treat it that way. Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, perhaps uh, we'll, we'll end it here. We're past the hour. There's gonna be a reception out there. I hope everyone can join us. Thank you again. For Thank you, everyone.